has built the historical materialism project. Good evening and welcome to HM Online, which is produced by Historical Materialism Journal. This is an alternative uh, set of program of events over the next 11 days, uh, an alternative to our 2020 London conference. We hold an annual conference in London every November. The program can be found on historicalmaterialism.org. You can register through the programme on that website and we then send out invitations for you to join the meetings in association with Haymarket's YouTube and all the details of the programme are on there. I should add that before I introduce the speakers, uh, we are taking questions, but questions will come through the YouTube chat facility, so you should register your questions there. Tonight, for this first session, we're very happy to be able to welcome an esteemed panel to discuss a recent book by David McNally, Blood and Money, War, Slavery, Finance and Empire. Our panel are David, who is the Cullen Distinguished Professor of History and Business at the University of Houston, uh, who is well known for his research on race, migration, gender and social reproduction in the development of global capitalism. David has written over seven books and 60 articles, notably his books Against the Market, Political Economy, M Market Socialism and the Marxist Critique, Political Economy and the Rise of Capitalism, a Reinterpretation, Bodies of Meaning, Studies in Language, Labour and Liberation, Another World is Possible, Globalization and Anti-Capitalism, Global Slump, The Economics and Politics of Crisis and Resistance, this book won the Paul Swayze Award, and Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires and Global Capitalism, which won the Deutsche Memorial Award. Uh, David's most recent book, Blood and Money, is the subject of our discussion today, and David will lead off to talk about that book. Discussing it with him are Titi Bhattacharya, who is the Associate Professor of History and the Director of Global Studies at Purdue, Univ Purdue University. She specializes in modern South Asian history, writes extensively on colonialism, nation and class formation, gender, and the politics of Islamophobia. Uh, her publications include Sentinels of Culture, Class Education and the Colonial Intellectual in Bengal, with Nancy Fraser and Cynthia Ruza, Feminism for the 99%, she was one of the editors of Social Reproduction Theory, Remapping Class, Recentering Oppression, and she's currently producing books on social reproduction theory, Gender as the Organizing Principle of Capital, and is co-editor of a book shortly to come out on Islam and Capitalism in the Global South. And finally, we have Maya Pal, who is the Senior Lecturer in International Relations at the University of Oxford Brookes. Her work mainly focuses on the relationship between international law and international relations, and specifically the practices of early modern imperial expansion, jurisdiction, and the problems of legal uh, subjectivity. She was one of the editors of the Extraterritoriality Extra of Law, History, Theory, Politics, and she has just released a new book, Jurisdictional Accumulation, an Early Modern History of Law, Empires, and Capital and we might want to bear in mind it's Christmas, and that will be an excellent stocking filler. So David is going to kick off, and then Tiffy and Maya will provide discussion, and then after that, uh, we'll have time for questions, and all three will respond to those questions. The session will be somewhere between 105 and 120 minutes. Okay, David, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Thank you to all the historical materialism organizers. Since 2003, I've been attending the HM conference in London. So it's sad that we've not been able to do it in person, but it remains the case that the historical materialism conference is certainly for me, 
the go-to event for serious discussion of Marxist theory and practice. Uh, thanks as well, of course, to Haymarket Books. And not only are they hosting these events, but for everybody watching and listening, you better take advantage of that 50% off all HM book titles uh, special that Haymarket is running right now. It's not to be missed. And finally, <clears throat> huge thanks to Tiffy and to Maya. These are scholar activists that I've respected for many years. They do amazing work both as theorists and as activists, and I really look forward to the discussion with them. What I want to do in the time that I have is to highlight some of the principal themes of blood and money, offer a few speculations about how the analysis I developed there might be applied to recent events since the book appeared. And then, of course, uh, welcome questions and, and discussion. Now, in Blood and Money, I offer a distinctive account of the origins and genesis of money, one that theorizes it as a technology of power and domination. In so doing, I challenge the foundational myth that underpins liberal economics and which smuggles its way into so many progressive leaning attempts to understand what money is. And in this fable of the market, money emerges organically from benign practices of mutual exchange and therefore is simply a neutral instrument that human beings created in order to make the exchange of goods and services simply easier. And in an overarching attack on this fable of the market, I submit that the origins of money are to be found in warfare and slave trading. And I try to document this historically and to develop the permutations through different kinds of constellations of empire in which this relationship between warfare and slave trading has evolved and changed with the development of new modalities of money. In so doing, I also adhere to a historical materialist protocol, which is that objects are inseparable from their histories. Money cannot be extracted from its immersion in blood and warfare. It enters the world to extend Marx's metaphor, dripping in blood and dirt, and it, in this way, it also reproduces itself. The book offers a dialectical typology according to which I suggest that over the last two and a half millennia, we have seen three world historic, or what I call modular forms of money each of them reconfiguring the technology of domination and violence. And I'm going to discuss each of these under three headings, each of the headings associated with a, a historical figure. The first uh, heading I'm describing as money, slavery, and warfare, or Cicero was a slave trader. The second, state finance and the constitution of bourgeois money, or Isaac Newton was a cop and a slave trader. And finally, number three, reconstituting imperial money, or perhaps commonsensically, Richard Nixon was a thug. And I'll try to take us through each of those with maybe just one or two more preliminaries before I dive right into each of those three themes. The other thing I want to highlight is that blood and money specifically as well responds to the hyper fetishism of money in late capitalism. And what I mean by that is that the proliferation of esoteric and abstract financial instruments like derivatives, financial derivatives, which were so intimately associated 
with the 2008-9 global crisis. The proliferation of these esoteric instruments has made it all too common for commentators to treat money as if it were nothing more than digital inscriptions or paper certificates uh, that orbit within a universe unto themselves. And this predisposition has carried over as well into scholarship in the new histories of US capitalism, for instance, which has been a real growth field in historical scholarship in the United States. The question of finance has loomed very large, but even one of its central contributors, that is a contributor to the new US histories of capitalism, concedes that what it generally offers is, quote, a capitalism born without blood, unquote. And this, I suggest, has a lot to do with the hyperfetishism associated with money and late capitalism. As a result, I try in the book to regularly pose the question, if money is part of a social process of abstraction, what is being abstracted from? And what I urge is that it is laboring bodies from which these financial forms abstract themselves. And so the book tries to offer not only a phenomenology of money, but also a phenomenology of the laboring body. And that includes the body in chains and the body at war. Okay, with those preliminaries, let me then proceed to the first section, Money, Slavery, and Warfare, or Cicero was a Slave Trader. The Roman statesman Cicero was a truly inveterate letter writer, corresponding with his beloved friend Atticus after a successful military campaign. He wrote, quote, as I write, there is about 120,000 sesterces on the platform. Now, sesterces were a very important Roman coin, initially silver, later copper. And so Cicero was informing his friend Atticus that he had 120,000 of these coins in front of him. Whereas in fact, as the totality of the letter makes clear, there were no coins on the platform in front of Cicero while he wrote. What was in front of him were enslaved humans, captives seized in a recent military campaign. So when Cicero tells Atticus that in front of him are 120,000 sesterces, it's not that he's lying, it's not that he's trying to deceive or fool Atticus, it is that he has undertaken the operation mentally that he will in fact undertake in social material practice. That is to say, he will sell these people. He will transform them into money. He will monetize human beings. And I start with this episode because I think it is salient with respect to the origins of money. One of the things I try to show in the early chapters is that ancient markets expanded on the basis more than anything else of warfare. Warfare was the driving process behind ancient market expansion. It had nothing to do with Adam Smith's ostensible propensity for individuals to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. Markets were powered by warfare because warfare was a crucial means of surplus appropriation. Remember, Surpluses do not have to only be appropriated from the local population. The whole drive to colonialism and empire is for external appropriation. And warfare figured absolutely centrally in that regard. Moreover, goods that were looted and plundered were much more readily marketized, that is to say they sold off, than the peasant's grain. Most peasant grain was produced for purposes of subsistence, for survival. It was produced as a use value. But huge amounts of what was plundered entered into market exchange. And 
at the center of warfare throughout the ancient world was slaving. The seizing of captives through violence and their transformation into commodities. What Cicero was doing as he looked at these captives of war in front of him was, as I say, intellectually monetizing them prior to the actual fact. And so Max Weber's observation that ancient wars were slave hunts seems to me to be entirely correct. What Weber missed was the degree to which those slave hunts were the foundation of ancient markets. And part of what I'm undertaking in Blood and Money is to make that connection. Ancient slaving was the foundation for some of the largest physical markets and the largest market transactions in the ancient world. Now, it's significant, of course, that this is happening with outsiders because it's a staple of critical anthropology, also an observation that Marx made on a number of occasions, that earlier processes of exchange happened with outsiders. And it's important to underline this because any form of social life that is based on reciprocity, that is based on some sort of gift economy, assumes that goods do not transact based on driving a bargain. Goods transact based on social obligation. And so it's been a commonplace to say that much early trade begins with outsiders. But what blood and money is adding to this picture is that not only does early trade, the growth of ancient markets, begin in transactions between outsiders rather than insiders, it begins with the exchange of outsiders, people who have been seized, captives, people who have been enslaved, through warfare. And across the ancient world, whether we're talking about Persia, the Mediterranean, North Africa, throughout the period associated with the emergence of coinage, we see an ongoing intensification and extensification of warfare. Warfare becomes larger, more geographically spread, more intensive, and more financially driven. And one of the fascinating things about this process is the ways in which it brings mercenaries and wage laborers into the picture. It does so in, in two ways. One, large standing armies that could be mobilized from front to front required soldiers capable of reproducing themselves. And so I think Marx is entirely right when, in an 1857 letter to Engels, he argues that it was in the army that the ancients first had fully developed a wage system. I think that's right. There were 400,000 soldiers in the Roman imperial army at its height, all receiving wages through the state. So I think that's absolutely right, that the army is one of the key sites of the early emergence of a wages system. But equally, tens of thousands of mercenary soldiers were essentially being hired throughout these conflicts. And one of the things which is fascinating about both of these categories, soldiers working for pay and mercenary soldiers on hire, is that ancient elite sources from the Socratics through to Cicero and beyond, all believed that mercenary activity and wage labor was essentially a form of slavery. They conflated any form of sale of your own bodily activity with slavery. And so someone who worked for wages was described with essentially the same terms in both ancient Latin and Greek as a slave, a mercenary soldier, and so on. And so what Marx may have missed in the story is that while it was the site for the development of a wages system, 
it was also one in which discourses and imageries of bondage hung over and percolated through all of these early histories of the wages system. And frankly, I think this is true in the early modern period as well, but I won't turn to that for the moment. Because of their imperial success over a large period of time, the dominant world money uh, in the ancient Mediterranean world was the Athenian owl coin. This was a silver coin and it proliferated throughout Eurasia. Archaeologists have found huge amounts of this coin, the Athenian owl coin, in Egypt, Syria, Afghanistan, and so on. For hundreds of years, the Athenian owl coin, the owl coin produced in ancient Athens, was the preferred form of international money in this regional world system. Now, this had something to do with its high quality, the quality of the silver that came from the Lorian mines of Athens, but I want to suggest something else that's important about this. Athens silver mines were worked by 30,000 slaves. In other words, its coins were a direct and immediate product of bonded labor. And as a result, ancient coinage, as it emerged as the first modular form of money, had a foundation in past labor. It was labor physically embodied in coins that underwrote these transactions. Moreover, it was given a divine character because public donations had long been associated with temples. The proto-monies, the pre-currencies prior to the emergence of coinage were all associated with temples because temples were where donations were made, wealth was redistributed, and so on. And as a result, we get this fascinating nexus which persists to modern days of money, religion, and the state all being inscribed on currency. In other words, currency bears images of state power, but it also bears images of divinity, of divine power. And if it's possible, to set up the images that I sent in. Image number one, which is a US $20 bill, illustrates the point where on the obverse, we have under the headline, the United States of America, in God we trust. In God we trust inscribed on currency. This is both an inscription by the state but it is also one that connects money in the most mystifying ways to temples, to divinity, to religious practice, and so on. And so I'm trying to highlight here the way in which in its emergence, money being a new phenomenon needed to be grounded in an ancient belief system, which gave it some trappings of divinity. And I think it's, it's striking the degree to which that continues even with US dollars, say, uh, today. And of course, part of what I'm trying to do in the book is to demystify this legitimating function by way of removing the mythology of money from the circuits of religious life and reinserting them in circuits of war, slavery, and empire. With that, Let's turn to the second historical figure and the second great historical moment in the development of money. State finance and the constitution of bourgeois money, I've called it, or Isaac Newton was a cop and a slave trader. Remember that ancient coinage persisted for hundreds of years. Feudal monarchies, tributary systems, commercial city-states continued to use coinage as the predominant recognizable form of monetary transactions for hundreds and hundreds of years. 
And this really did not undergo a qualitative change until the 1690s and the emergence of the Bank of England as part of the completion of the century of revolution through which new forms of bourgeois rule became predominant in England. But once again, war was central to this transformation and slavery was lurking in the background the entire time. Let me just provide a small slice of background. In 1694, England's new bourgeois monarchy, having been established thanks to the so-called Glorious Revolution, the English state was in a position to resume its wars, particularly with France. And to do so, an essentially bankrupt state, because the Stuarts had more or less bankrupted the English crown, a bankrupted state had to turn to financial markets. And it did so by way of contracting a war loan. The Bank of England, as constituted in 1694, was a consortium of investors who advanced a war loan to the English government. However, it gave much of this loan in paper certificates, IOUs rather than in gold or silver. And what this meant was that the English crown in the first instance was purchasing goods and services with which to make war by means of paper IOUs. And these paper IOUs were then received by those providing whatever military goods, foodstuffs, and so on might be involved, and the recipients of these paper notes were recirculating them. We now have, in other words, the entry of pure paper money into general circulation. This is the first moment in this new evolutionary process. However, it could have been a one-off it could have been an expedient that didn't really fundamentally transform the monetary system, except that war persisted for a century and a quarter. Year after year, decade after decade, the English government went back to this group of private investors called the Bank of England, and it requested further loans. And each time, more and more paper notes issued by the Bank of England circulated as money in the first instance for purposes of war. And in the process, these became increasingly integrated into the entire financial structure, in part because the English government announced in 1698 that it would accept them in payment for taxes. This gave them a much greater generality. The state was now acknowledging their universality in the payment of taxes. But why should these be accepted? Well, in the first instance, the English government, as a bourgeois monarchy, did something unprecedented. It committed specific revenue streams from taxation to repaying these loans. So note what this means. We have paper bills and notes circulating. They are simple IOUs, promises to pay. But the British government has guaranteed the investors that they will be paid out of future tax revenues. So the very structure of paper money is introducing a new modality into the monetary system. Coins are products of past labor. There is past labor embodied in them. Bills and notes are promises that they will be supported out of future labor that comes in the form of future taxes. It's true these were loosely tied to precious metal, but what is revolutionary about the introduction of these notes is that these were private notes issued by a private institution, the Bank of England, and secured by public debt, by state 
debt. And so private notes reflecting public debt, state debt, was now circulating as money. This was not an easy operation. It was very difficult to secure the universal circulation. Okay, we've had a temporary freeze of David's connection. Please bear with us and we'll return shortly. listeners for that disruption. I had a computer crash and I have now moved to a different system. Let me pose the problem of why this new form of money should have been socially acceptable. Because as I say, it was a bizarre form based on future promises to pay. And yet it became increasingly dominant within the monetary system. And there were four key developments which were instrumental to allowing paper money to begin to operate as if it were as good as coinage, as if it were as secure as precious metal. First, I've already mentioned that the British state promised to back all of these paper notes out of specific tax revenues. It was committing future income to financial markets. Secondly, I mentioned the payment of taxes. If you could use these to pay taxes, all investors were going to have to pay some kinds of taxes, then they had increased currency. Third, the law required that the Bank of England keep a stock of precious metal appropriate to a certain percentage of all the notes in circulation. This meant, number one, that it couldn't simply proliferate them endlessly because it had to back them up with a certain amount of precious metal, gold and silver, with which for centuries financial markets had been most comfortable. It meant that a certain kind of monetary discipline was imposed upon the bank 
as a result of what Marx was to call the metallic barrier associated with this arrangement. And tied to this is the myth associated with currency, including British pounds. And here, if image number two is available, please bring it up. This is an English 20 pound note. But what I find most striking about this 20 pound note is that under the banner Bank of England, it says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of 20 pounds. Now note, this is 20 pounds. So what does it mean to promise the bearer to pay on demand 20 pounds when it is 20 pounds? You accept it in wages as 20 pounds. The butcher, the brewer, and the baker, famous to Adam Smith, all accept it as 20 pounds. But the idea is that there's something beyond paper that backs it up. This is a foundational myth. It's a fiction associated with the fact that state-based monies derived from the public debt represent, as Marx said, a fictitious capital. They represent a form of wealth that is not yet real. It will become real if the tax revenue accrues, but it is in principle fictitious. But there was one more dimension. Thank you for that image. There is one more dimension of the securing of paper money and the entire monetary system in the 1690s and the decades immediately after. And that is the war waged by Isaac Newton. Newton was appointed in the 1690s as warden of the London Mint. Three years later, he was appointed master of the mint. Now, his first obligation was to figure out a process of minting English coins where they couldn't be clipped very easily, as had been a historic problem. Coins with very soft little edges could easily be clipped for gold and silver, even copper. But more than this, in addition to creating a more secure form of minting, Newton went on a personal campaign to hunt down clippers and counterfeiters. He set up a system of spies. He himself went in disguise on a regular basis into inns and pubs where he hunted down and trapped counterfeiters, clippers of coins, and sent them to prison and to the gallows. In the first three years as warden of the Mint, Newton personally oversaw the imprisonment of 100 alleged counterfeiters in London alone. In his first year on the job, 15 of them went to the gallows and were executed in London. And so what we have here finally is the backing up of the monetary system with, with the death penalty, what you might call the death penalty as monetary policy, reinforcing Peter Leinbaugh's observation that the early bourgeois state in England functioned as a thanatocracy, as a state organized around the reality or the threat of capital punishment. In other words, as the new monetary system was being cast, it was also secured at the gallows. It was secured in blood. Money's second modular form thus bore all the traces of violence and domination of, that its first form did. In addition, of course, this was a monetary form that laid the financial architecture of the British Empire. It financed an endless succession of wars by which Britain established itself as the world's dominant colonial power, but also too often missed in the story by the middle of the 18th century, the world's largest slave trader. The Royal Africa Company and all of its descendants moved more enslaved Africans through monetary and commodity circuits than did any other colonial power. And here, once again, 
Newton was in on the act. He and his good buddy, John Locke, Locke had actually nominated Newton for his position at the London Mint. Both Newton and Locke were significant investors in the Royal Africa Company and the South Sea Company, the two most important early 18th century uh, and earlier in the case of the Royal Africa Company, slave trading companies in Britain. Locke was also an early investor in the Bank of England, but here too his slave trading was in good company because two of the bank's earliest governors, Gilbert Heathcote and Humphrey Morris, were among the largest slave dealers in the whole of England. So when a progressive left-leaning commentator argues recently that the creation of the Bank of England was, quote, a great civilizational advance, unquote, you will understand why I dissent. The Bank of England was a consortium for war finance whose directors were colonizers and slave traders, and it was in their image, in their relationship to the English state, that central banking was created. Let me turn finally to the third modality, the third modular form of money under the heading reconstituting imperial money or Richard Nixon was a thug. Now, the history of money in the United States is incredibly chaotic and idiosyncratic. On the eve of the Civil War, there were 7,000 different banknotes in currency in circulation being circulated by more than 1,600 discrete banks. However, two forms of early U.S. money, I suggest, are indicative of the overall trajectory of monetary history in the United States. The first is tobacco money, created in Virginia in 1642. And the second is a wave of different land bank monies originating in South Carolina in 1712 and then proliferating throughout the early US colonies. Now, what's significant about tobacco money and land banked money? And by the way, with respect to the latter land bank money, Benjamin Franklin famously referred to it as coined land, uh, an amazing kind of uh, description, but one that does get at something. Now, what's significant is that tobacco money and coined land both gesture to key sources of American capitalism, slave labor, and the appropriation and dispossession of indigenous lands. Tobacco money is nothing but the physical, but certificates representing the physical product, tobacco, of slave labor. And coined land was underwritten by ongoing wars of dispossession and extermination against indigenous peoples as more and more land was seized this was the very foundation on which land banks were constituted, that they would expand into new territories, bring new land within their jurisdiction, sell them off, pay their, repay their debts, and so on. So foundationally, then, money in the United States is deeply inscribed with just the kinds of violence and domination that I've been discussing. And all of the major shifts in the history of money in the United States are associated with warfare and violence. The ultimate centralization of the system comes as a result of the Civil War, when the banking system is for the first time brought under some significant and enduring kind of state regulation. The turning point in the creation of a central bank, the Federal Reserve, constituted in 1913 is the U.S. drive towards becoming a colonial power, which is, of course, itself part and parcel of the First World War, which breaks out within a year of the creation of the Federal Reserve. And then the third significant development and the one that creates the final modular form of money is the American war in Vietnam in the 1960s and 70s. Now, 
I will briefly outline the significance of all of this and then turn to a couple of conclusions. After the Second World War, under the so-called Bretton Woods Agreement, the global economy, world capitalism, was reconstituted on a dollar gold standard. The dollar agreed by the American government would be equal to one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold. So the dollar was tied to gold. All other major currencies were tied to the dollar and therefore through the dollar, they were indirectly connected to gold. The dollar was said to be as good as gold as a result. And so long as American capitalism dominated trade markets, that held good. So long as its overall payments were in surplus with the rest of the world, this was a very secure arrangement. But two things undid those foundations. First, capitalism is rivalry. And new centers of accumulation, particularly in manufacturing, from Japan and Germany specifically, began to contest US domination of global markets. And secondly, costs of empire. By the early 1970s, the US was burning through about $8 billion a year in the cost of empire as a result of the escalating war in Vietnam and the heroic resistance of the Vietnamese people to American empire and its war machine. So now America's trade partners were dealing with an immense surplus of dollars. They were receiving dollars from the United States in trade, through military expenditure and so on, and they didn't need them to buy US goods and services, so they started redeeming them for gold as they were entitled to, $35 to an ounce. In 1968, 40% of all US gold reserves left the country. 40% and things were getting worse in terms of US trade and in terms of the costs of its losing war in Vietnam. As a result, it was clear that eventually the United States would be out of gold. It bullied its trade partners. Nixon was a thug, but nevertheless, some of them continued to cash dollars in for gold. As a result, American imperialism had three choices. It could wind down its war and pull back its exercises of empire. It could let its gold reserves disappear and figure out what that meant. Or it could close the gold window and stop allowing the conversion of dollars for gold. And that's precisely what Nixon did on August 15th of 1971, when they said to their trade partners, you can't get gold for dollars anymore, you're stuck with them. Now, this was an expedient, but in fact, it was the beginning of yet another monetary revolution. Because what we have from 1971 onwards is the emergence of a system in which the US dollar circulates as world money, no longer even tenuously tied, like was required under the Bank of England, no longer even tenuously tied to precious metal. The US dollar circulates as a pure fiat money issued by a state with no legal convertibility for anything else. And this meant, of course, enormous destabilization. And I want to finish the discussion of the US dollar on these notes before making two final points. The United States was able to reconstitute world money as an imperial fiat money but it meant entering into a new system of floating currencies in which no stable exchange rates and no stable values for currencies exist. As a result, currency trading and speculation exploded from $15 billion a year in 1973 to over 5 trillion by 2016. This is the monetary basis of so-called financialization, the destabilization of currency values 
that lead to an immense growth of currency speculation. It also meant the emergence of a whole series of new financial instruments meant to stabilize relationships among currencies, and these are particularly financial and currency derivatives, which played such an important role in speculative form in the 2008-9 crisis. But it also meant that freed from the metallic constraint represented by gold, the US and global money supplies have soared. And if we could put up image three, the last image I'm going to show you, this comes from the Federal Reserve Bank and essentially shows us the explosion of the US money supply. You see it rising slowly through the 1980s and 90s as they begin to figure out what imperial fiat money means and how it operates. And then it keeps escalating, rising more, and particularly as we get into the crises from 2008-9 onward. This monetary explosion is possible because the metallic constraint of gold has been eliminated. There is no longer a tie to a commodity form of wealth that disciplines governments and financial markets. But all of this too needs to be defetishized. It's crucially important to point out that the reason this is possible is because of the great doubling in the size of the global working class during the neoliberal period. The growth of huge proletarian masses, particularly in Asia, and the flows of global surplus value from south to north that underpin these arrangements, something which I'm happy to come back to in the discussion period. Let me end with just two points with respect to the current moment, something I don't talk about in the book. First, I think that the new crisis of 2020, which actually in economic terms began in the fall of 2019, but then was massively deepened as a result of the global pandemic, is showing, demonstrating, what central banks can do freed from the gold constraint, freed from ties to precious metal, because of course they are intervening more massively than ever before in the banking system and financial markets to monetize debt and to stimulate economies. This will produce new contradictions and new rivalries, but it also means that the modalities of crisis are changing because the state does have enhanced capacities to directly affect and impact global markets. Secondly, the pandemic, social unrest, police violence, and racial capitalism. Because if we're seeing anything dramatically at the moment, and I'm speaking as someone living and working in the United States, it is that all of the patterns of racial capitalism are being dramatically intensified. And here I want to remind all of us of Ruth Wilson Gilmore's really legendary now formulation of racism in her blockbuster Golden Gulag. One sentence, quote, racism specifically is the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death, unquote. The COVID-19 pandemic is living and dying demonstration of that fact. And as the system undergoes greater instabilities, we get escalations of police violence, which mean yet more murders of African Americans in the streets of the United States. In this sense, I want to conclude by saying that the history of money has always been about the political economy of death. And this is the profound sense in which the fight against the regulation of social life by money, which is at the foundation of any revolutionary socialist project inspired by Marx, that we seek to break the rule of abstract labor, the law of value, 
and money over human life. As a result, it is a fight for life. It is the fight to free the flow of blood from the circuits of money to free life from capitalism's death drive. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. Thank you, David. Uh, perhaps if we can turn now to to Mr. Green Tithy first, and then Maya, or the other way around. Let's go with Tithy then. Okay. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, thank you, um, comrades, on historical materialism and Haymarket for giving us all this opportunity to discuss David's splendid book, which uh, reads very much like a detective novel. And I will uh, talk a little bit about why that is. It is a book about investigation and unveiling. So it follows a train or trail of blood through human history and tries to mark the spots that are relevant in the history of life and labor um, under uh, various class societies. And as the world heads towards recession and streets erupt in glorious revolts against racism and the rich, it is only appropriate that we discuss this splendid book, Blood and Money, which traces the hidden history of violence that make up all economic orders. I want to pause on the conceptual charge of hidden because that plays a central organizing principle of the book. As Marxists, we are familiar with the procedures capitalism undertakes to wash the blood from its economic dealings. And that's part of uh, what Marx undertakes to show or reveal, and that David does in the latter part of the book as well. Indeed, when we come to chapters 26 to 33 of Capital, Volume 1, we are suddenly and strikingly unmoored from an abstract discussion of value and commodities and unceremoniously dragged through the mud of colonial battlefields, the murderous waters of the Middle Passage, and through verdant African lands transformed by ferocious hunters of human beings. Suddenly, we are no longer even in the hidden abode of production, where Marx has to use symbolism to convey the violence of capitalist exchange. Here, in these chapters, in the glare of the past, we are thrust relentlessly into histories of direct and open violence that forms the prehistory of that exchange. But what about pre-capitalist societies where the various social orders, whether slave economies or feudal ones, were predicated upon such open violence? Would economic dealings in such societies adopt similar technologies of hiding? In other words, if your society is about direct appropriation of surplus uh, labor through violence, then would you need to hide and engage in procedures of hiding when it came to economic activities? David's wonderful book answers that question with a resounding yes, as it recovers a stunning archeology span of secrets that all economic orders must necessarily keep in order to veil a foundational violence, that the basis of their order is the labor of bodies who must have no legitimation or social recognition. So that to me is the central procedure of the book to uncover and trace that history of secrets and hidden 
history of violence through archaic Greece to, of course, the uh, brilliant um, way uh, um, David sums it up as Richard Nixon is a thug. But I will mention here uh, three uh, methodologies that three features of the methodology that David employs in this task that I think um, were, are, are still extremely instructive to us uh, as students of Marxism and as historians in the field. So three, and then I will raise some questions that I hope uh, we can discuss in, 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 uh, in the discussion part of it. The three crucial elements of Marx's methodology that Davis employs to a great effect are first, imminent criticism. So Marx develops what he calls new principles from the existing principles of the world. So this methodology where nothing, as he says, as Marx says, falls from the sky, but actually develops in the crucible of the past social order. And this is this imminent criticism that things do not come brand new, but bear traces of the past is something, a method that David employs masterfully throughout the book as he tracks the money form and marks the points at which it betrays its origins. So not only just in the actual constitution of the metal that forms the money, but also in philosophical ways, in language that um, uh, state powers and elites tried to hide the trail of blood that constitutes the money form. So imminent criticism is a very important procedure that David employs in the book to marvelous effect. The second and equally important is the dialectical relationship between the abstract and the concrete where concrete historical de developments, in particular slavery and war, but also the breakdown of a gift economy, uh, the rise of new elites, how those concrete historical developments made it possible to achieve in thought the very abstract forms that would create general equivalents such as coinage that could serve as a measure of value of all things. So the, the first example that David um, gave in his uh, talk earlier about Cicero, for Cicero to be able to say that um, in, in writing, certain historical developments have to have happened already in order for Cicero to actually be able to conceive of human beings as, uh, 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 as money or as coins. So he, David also traces the violence of abstraction. What does abstraction actually mean? And, and I found the discussion of Plato particularly uh, illuminating in talking about the, uh, uh, the, the, the relationship between the abstract and the concrete. And mind you, and all the while as Marxists, as we read this, we realize that he is setting us up for when we get to abstract labor versus sensuous concrete labor in the capitalist form itself. So this is a, a appetizer for us in understanding how we get to the current moment, but it is also a reminder that the current moment bears traces of the past that it um, uses and recrafts itself from. The third, and this is something that I think uh, we will see perhaps a new story emerge from this book, perhaps a second book, is David's meticulous attention to the state form or what Marx calls the concentrated and organized force of society. I found it absolutely compelling, for instance, how David uses the distinction made by anthropologists between reciprocal and redistributive forms 
to show not just the transition from private to public forms of wealth management, but more importantly, to show how only when the state could emerge as a generalized expression of the public or common interest, could that state then stamp its authority on coins and put them in general circulation. So the relationship between uh, the state and the coinage is a, is a relationship or, or money is a relationship that uh, David follows assiduously through, um, through the book. So I have two uh, sort of questions which um, I hope we will get a chance to discuss. So the first is, it was clear to me from David's account that trade and gro growth of markets in archaic Greece with their attendant slaving and raiding features contributed to the emergence and consolidation of coinage. But my question is, what part did trade play in this mode of production? Because I understand it to have been fairly marginal. In which case, is there not another story to be told as to why the procedure of equivalence that money generates, even though it was marginal in this society, it did not die out, but instead was carried over to successive modes of production. So that's sort of my first question. And the second I have, which is a more historical question, is the role of non-European money forms and the institutions from which they develop. For instance, um, we know the Mauryan Empire and its coinage was intimately connected to the rise of Buddhism and the role of monasteries, sort of in the similar way that David shows the role of Greek temples to play in archaic Greece. So what, what kind of um, relationship that might bear in so far different parts of the globe. And I'm also, and similarly, uh, I'm curious what role bills of exchange widely used by the Ottomans and the Mughals by the 16th century have in this story. Because one of the things that we're talking about uh, was, you know, the, the, the faith uh, um, the IOU is the faith in the state, but this is a faith in older networks of merchant relationship between different trading anthropodes of the world. And so, you know, it would be wonderful to hear what you thought of such um, instruments of credit and pre-capitalist finance, such as uh, Hundi's uh, bills of exchange and so forth. But although I have these questions, they do not and cannot dim the voices of the oppressed, sometimes tortured, sometimes jubilant, that David has so carefully and meticulously recovered for us and recovered them against their muffling by history and class society. So thank you, David. Okay, thank you, Tithi. If we can then move on to Maya. Great, thank you. Um, so, I'm, oh, I'm hearing an echo. Is that normal? Okay, I'll just go on. Um, so, uh, thank you to organisers, um, to Haymarket, and especially to uh, David and Tiffy for uh, having me discuss with them this incredible book. Um, and it's uh, it's just yeah it's really an honor and a privilege to be here to discuss it. So um, so David's book for me felt really like the culmination of a lifetime of work, and I could really tell you know all, all the Paul listed the the publications and and you know the incredible scholarship that you've produced, and it really feels like a lot of that really comes together in this book uh, in this reflection on the history of capitalism and more broadly of structure structures of domination and expropriation. It is so elegantly written, uh, it's meticulously researched, uses a wide range of historical sources, uh, it's vibrant and accessible way beyond Marxist debates. 
Um, its biggest contribution to me, and there are many, but uh, I obviously particularly appreciated the uh, bringing in legal bodies, and I mean legal bodies in the corporeal and as well as the institutional sense, uh, right at the centre of Marxist theory. And so I have kind of three aspects uh, that I want to discuss in my comments. Um, uh, first of which being methodology, so it's interesting uh, that uh, Tiffy was still uh raise these and and it'll be interesting to see how they uh, relate um and second uh flowing from that some philosophical and ontological foundations of the argument uh which really uh got my, my head thinking and and i really appreciate uh what, what happened there in the book and finally uh, some thoughts on the state again <laughs> agreeing with Tithi on the importance of that um, and uh, also in terms of key agents of capitalist expansion and their relationship to, to, the, to the English state, more specifically, I'll be focusing on that. So in terms of methodology, I mean, you know, it's fascinating. I was reading, reading the book was really just such a, uh, a masterful um, uh, example of how to embark on a large scale historical project. And there are, there are many ways to do this, as we all know, and a lot of, I guess, of the Marxist work has been focusing on the origins of capitalism and, and trying to situate and debate the origins and expansion of capitalism. And, and this is obviously part of the book, but it's not your primary question. Uh, neither is the kind of endurance of pre-capitalist or non-capitalist process in capitalism, though also this question is addressed. But what I understood here and what really struck me was this search for structural connections. And I'm not sure I'm completely happy with that framing, but it helped me to understand what you were doing. These connections are maintained and adapted across non-capitalist and, and pre-capitalist and capitalist periods. And I think that relates to the imminent criticism point that um, Titi was making. So you say in all class societies, money is bound with domination and expropriation. Um, and you have the sentence that I really liked, that all great historical transformations involve complex social processes that rework seeming continuities into new constellations of power and production. Right. And so the role of origins and transitions is, is deployed really originally, I think, through that um, primary question of um, what I am going to call, and I'm not sure <laughs> if you're going to like this or not, but a sort of biological internalism. Right. Um, and you write, you know, you have to start from the but the body is in a central protocol. So starting from the body, from this a theory of world money, although not a general one, as you're very careful to, to specify, and then elaborated through the context of war and especially war finance. And another really clear statement for me is when you say you're tracking the specific social transformations that made possible the emergence of money as an increasingly autonomous social power. So the body is used in a fascinating way throughout the book, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in my kind of section on, on ontological questions, but it's used in real and metaphorical senses. Um, you use a wide range of biological images, blood, obviously, uh, but also bones, metamorphosis, um, various verbs, organic verbs, such as gestating, mutating, transmogrifying, transplanting, incubating, bleeding, etc. And I'm sure I'm missing many. And there's this dialectic of social relations as living organisms. Um, and, and I think this is, yeah, it's just beautifully done. And it, I think it does provide us with uh, you know, original, at least extremely refreshing uh, methodology. So in terms of philosophical and ontological um, aspects, so a key foundation for me was this um, um, ability to analyse relations between money, people and things as form. And there are fascinating discussions of the ways in which philosophy is enmeshed with the social relations of production of all the class societies you discuss. Um, so the crucial shift occurs when ancient Greek philosophers start to see, as you quote, the world is constituted of universal substances or forms whereby people and things become subsumed by money. Um, and these are symptoms, quote again, of a society with full-fledged universal equivalent whose metrics infiltrate manifold spheres of everyday life, from the cost of enslaved people to the relative values of friends. So a key point that helped me understand the implications of this argument was the link between money and truth as infinite and as ontologically equivalent forms. Um, and I just think that's so helpful and, and also just such an important point to try and discuss a bit more. But, and I think this enables you to emphasize the distinction between thing and activity right, or cause and result. Um, and uh, you take historians to task for confusing or conflating those processes, especially mercantilists, political economists. 
uh, who fail to disaggregate money as both a thing, precious metal, and the activity that brings it to being, labor. So too often the result is mistaken for a cause. So instead, uh, David argues that money is an outside ontological possibility of exchangeability. <laughs> it's a mouthful, but I love that uh, sentence. I think it really speaks to, to the core of what you're doing. And so money, is, this means that money is the outside property of things as use values. I quote you here more extensively, money is not the price of this coat, that loaf of bread or this automo automobile, automobile. It is a very possibility of particular things as numbers, exchange values, the quality of things that makes the many different numbers, prices possible. So it is, hence it is infinite and equivalent to the concept of true. So where I have a question now on this is in concerning conceptualization as, of the body as a concrete thing, uh, as opposed to money uh, as abstract and to commodities as mathematical categories. And I see why it makes sense in the argumentation because it provides the link to the activity, the labor, that tends to be forgotten, right? So bringing it back to the body, it grounds the argument in physical material basis. However, I also wonder whether there was a danger in maybe instrumentalizing the body and restricting it to a thing that is concrete and whole. Um, and adopting perhaps in that case an overly biological conception of it. Uh, and you say that under capitalism, the body is now subordinated to the phenomenology of money and the market and reconceptualized in the categories of mathematized space and time. So it's this victory of decorporalization where the body is no longer regulated spatial and temporal rhythms. So I don't disagree at all, obviously, in the ways in which capitalism takes over the body's relationship to the world. But um, I think it will be also interesting to have a further discussion here about, uh, about the body assumed to be a thing that can be understood in itself, individually. And rather, maybe we should also think of it as a lived experience that requires otherness to exist and to understand itself. And um, acknowledging, I guess, that the body is used as a heuristic device uh, to track transformations, which you do so well, um, and that it's not necessarily treated ontologically for what it is. Um, but, you know, a, a materialist and dialectical approach to the body would also need to understand um, to understand that it does not just assume it is a thing or a cause, but it's also an activity. Right. So kind of using your distinction that you use uh, previously for us understanding the body. OK, my final section, I hope I still have a bit of time. Um, is on the state. Uh, great, okay, I'll stop rushing too much then. Um, so the state and key agents of capitalist expansion, and I mean there's so much I could say about this and I just just wanted to try and say at least something in a few minutes I have, but uh, you know the, the richness of these arguments I think is going to take us all you know a lot of time and, and I hope we're going to engage in many discussions uh, in the future as well about this. So, um, you, so you define capitalism in relation to um, expansion in terms of uh, as being sustained by a hegemonic form of paper money developed by the Bank of England and the state uh, to sustain wars and uh, warfare and time. So Britain's hegemony dependent on public debt, heavy taxation and paper money. Right. And so we've already mentioned how the role of the state is absolutely fundamental here. Um, state or state form. Uh, again, that would be an interesting discussion. And your conceptualization of the state is based on this distinction between its internal and external manifestations or, or logics. Um, and this I've been really thinking about for a long time, actually, because you, I mean, you've published this already in, uh, in other pieces, and I've just been trying to, to really think about how this works. And, and so I'm, I'm still in that process. <laughs> But I'm, I'm going to put it out there because I'd just like to hear to hear more from you on it as well. So the distinction you take this from Marx and Engels and the German ideology, where they write that um, a modern civil society must assert itself in its external relations as nationality and internally must organize itself as state. And then you um, so you develop this further. And again, I'm going to um, quote you here a bit at length. Um, you say in its relations with other states, capitalist power must condense itself as a national entity capable of mobilizing the force of the nation as a whole under its sovereign command. To do this, it must also be able to organize itself as state. And this requires that it subordinates all competing political powers under the sovereign rule of a centralized apparatus of government and administration. And it's really interesting then you also go into more detail, we'll see historically on how uh, the English state and the 15th century is not yet, uh, is mostly internal, um, uh, internally 
defending itself and not so much externally. So you put a lot of nuance in how this applies to the early modern period. Um, and obviously it comes much more uh, as, a, as a finished product in, in uh, the 19th century. Um, and the distinction, I think, is helpful because it forces us to look more at the state in terms of legal borders, in terms of property. And um, as uh, Colin Barker uh, noted as well in Marx's theory, generally the external concerns of states tend to be tagged on as a, an afterthought right, and not taken into the general analysis of the form and functions of the capitalist state. And I think well, you've done exactly the opposite. You've managed to, um, to bring the internal and external uh, functions um, into the general analysis of the form and, 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 and provide a dialectical uh, analysis of those. But I guess I'm also still quite weary of the danger of that distinction and how it can be very quickly misinterpreted and used. And as anybody uh, reads international relations theory, we know that the, the damage that internal and external concepts can do. So I, I'm also a little bit yeah, cautious somehow, even though I, I can see how, how you obviously avoid those traps. So my final point um, uh, is about agency and, and specific agents and, and merchants particularly. And I'll put merchants, traders and, and slavers, I guess, together. Um, and there's such you know, fascinating rich accounts of the activities, but also the discourses, the ideas of these um, either primary agents of capitalist expansion or just of other forms of domination and expropriation. And I wonder whether you thought more could be said about the merchants uh, leading in terms of their conceptions of racial and civilizational superiority in the 17th century, because I don't think the literature really focuses so much on their ideological role. And I'm wondering, and that's something I'm just curious about. And, and I found examples of this with Christian consuls um, in the Mediterranean and their behavior towards the Ottomans. And very early in the 17th century, we're already seeing these distinctions of, of racial and civilizational superiority. Um, and so I can't obviously, um, and I think it's also interesting because it helps us to think more concretely and legally about how these merchants exercised their power. And obviously, I have to see this in terms of jurisdictionality or jurisdiction, um, uh, and that's no surprise. But so my question would be, yeah, would you give merchants an ideological role um, and a specific imperial agency as opposed to other actors such as settlers, governors, you were mentioning investors a lot in your talk, etc. And the military, obviously, which would be another key actor. Um, and this links to the discussion around new merchants building from Brenner and their links to the rise of the capitalist gentry, which uh, was also really fascinating. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you so much again. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the discussions. OK, thank you very much, Maya. What I'm going to do now is give David the opportunity to immediately respond for about five minutes to those two excellent commentaries. Then I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, please forgive me if I don't choose yours. We'll only have time for four or five, but we will keep them on file. Uh, then we'll conclude, I suspect, after giving uh, uh, the, the opportunity for the panel to respond. Uh, can I also say, just a hype from, from the chat, uh, the Marxist Education Project in the chat is hosting online reading groups on blood and money. Uh, its next 10-week sequence starts on January the 25th. Uh, and they are giving their details there as to how to join that. So obviously a further engagement with this important book is to be valued. But David, over to you if you'd like to make an immediate response. Thank you, Paul. And just huge thanks to Maya and to Tithi for not only really generous comments, but it's one of the rewards of writing is to have interlocutors who both reveal to you some of what you were doing in ways you didn't fully appreciate, uh, but also push you to think a little bit more fully and, uh, and reflectively about where you were going and what you were doing. So obviously I cannot do justice to the richness of those comments. Uh, I look forward to just rewatching this part of the, uh, the video to, uh, to refresh myself on it. So, and, and one of the points overlaps so much that I'll try to, to, to deal with it uh, together. I loved the way in which Tithy articulated part of this project in terms of procedures of hiding and 
effectively trying to develop methodological ways of tracking those procedures. And I think if if there's one thing that I most treasure in Marxist capital, it is the way in which from the start he says to us, nothing in this world of capital is self-evident. Everything is topsy-turvy. Everything is inside out. Everything is inverted. And therefore, we're going to need what I'll call procedures of dialectical detection to track the unseen, to visibilize the invisible, and to theorize and explain it. And I really loved a number of the images that Tithy mobilized and deployed uh, to highlight that, the archaeology of secrets and, and so on. And, and these, are, these are things I'll, I'll take away from the conversation and think about a little bit more. I think the most important historical meditation that Tithy brought to the table is trying to think through some of the historical moments that didn't necessarily produce globally modular forms of money. Tithy, for example, was highlighting bills of exchange in the Ottomans. And I think that's right. I think you know, this is one of the contributions of a lot of Jairus Banaji's recent research has been to remind us how developed commercial capital was in a whole series of so-called non-Western contexts. The case which fascinated me, uh, I made tons of notes on and never entered into the book in the end was, oh, sorry, it entered very marginally, was the extended experiments with paper money in China. They were the innovators where pa the Chinese state, where paper money was concerned. And the reason it doesn't play a large role in the book, and this may not be a good reason, is that ultimately it collapsed and it didn't generalize. I find it personally a fascinating case study, but they were not able to generalize it into a sustainable form. And I think a large part of that has to do with the ways in which taxation changes in a bourgeois monarchy. Uh, and I, I, I hint at that in the book. Tributary and feudal states simply do not have to answer to financial markets in the way that the bourgeois monarchy of the 1690s did. And I think, in fact, that's what doomed the, the Chinese uh, experiments with, with paper money. And then the, con the, the reflections on the state form, uh, I'm going to in a minute, because they overlap so much as well with, with Maya's point, is return to, I think, someone who inspired so many of us, and that is the late Colin Barker who also was a huge fan of the project I was doing with Blood and Money, he gave me comments on one of the chapters until he became really too sick to continue to do it. So I want to come back to that issue in a moment. But two quick points uh, that, that Maya put out other than the state form. I think you're right, Maya, around this question of biological internalism. And, I, you know, I think... There is a sense in which, as you say, tracking these structural connections, there is a debt to people like Stephen Jay Gould in what I'm doing, because Gould says to us, the reason we know that human bodies are historical is because of the things that are not purely functional. The remainders, the leftovers, human beings have tailbones. They don't need tailbones. They're not functional to our lives. And so I think that's right. There, there are sedimentations historically that, that, that give us a sense of these continuities, even though enormous structural transformations take place. The problem of the body, I think, recurs for every one of us who wants to insist on the social materiality of bodies, the corporeal foundations of life. And all I can really say is that I hope I gesture sufficiently to the idea of historical bodies.
as I've argued elsewhere, I think there are, if you will, three great modern theorists of historical bodies, Darwin, Marx, and Freud. And they all insist on the ways in which bodies carry histories, that we cannot simply reify it as a thing. There are histories of labor, desire, and natural selection and sexual selection that are reproduced in bodies, and they are therefore historical and yet material. And I think that is one of the most difficult problems for us to develop an adequate conceptual language for. Finally, the question of the state and external and internal relations uh, and so on that Maya raised, but it relates to Tithy's on the state form. And here I really just want to pay tribute to the late Colin Barker. Colin was one of the first people in the Marxist debates going back to the 1970s to say to us, stop developing a theory of the state in the singular and recognize that that the theory, if it is going to be adequate, has to be capable of operating at the level of many states. And that is a kind of methodological and theoretical insight I've tried to live with. I don't say I always do it justice, but Colin Barker's injunction to recognize that the plurality of the state, of the state system, shapes states internally is one of the insights that I hope I've carried through here. Thank you, Paul. I'll stop there. And thank you again to my wonderful interlocutors. Okay, thank you very much, David. Uh, with apologies to anybody whose questions I don't choose, I'm going to choose two or three questions and let the panel respond to them. If we have time, there'll be two or three more. But if we can begin with uh, China Meville, with respect to Richard Seaford's money and early Greek mind, can you talk about relations between money and systems of ideas and culture in general and in particular modalities you identify. Uh, a second question I'd like us to uh, discuss is from, let me just bring it up, Pinar, who asks, uh, how do states' conditions of reproduction within capitalist relations of production change parallel to the changing forms of money as well as modalities of crisis. And then we have Colin Moores. Can you say something more about the relationship between slavery, money, and capitalism? Should I let David attack those questions first? Yeah, that's fine. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, <laughs> amazing set of, of questions. And uh, China clearly picked up on the fact that Richard Seaford's meditations on money and, and ancient philosophy, ancient Greek philosophy, are really quite important to me. And they, they, they play a significant role in my thinking in chapter one of the book, because Seaford wants to insist that a society in which money becomes exchangeable with all things produces a unique intellectual revolution in which, if you'll allow me, things are increasingly stripped of their particularities and inserted into a cognitive system of universal categories, substances, and forms. And Seifert essentially argues to us that these great innovations of Greek philosophy, and he's not the first one to do it, but I think he does it more systematically and with greater detail than any of his predecessors, that to begin to think of the world as, as, as being illuminated by universal properties and forms becomes possible only when specificity and concreteness is being upset in everyday life. That circuits of money 
and the universal character that is Aristotle says, it can exchange for all things. That universal property un initiates a kind of, uh, and runs parallel with and interacts with a sort of conceptual and philosophical transformation. Uh, and so, yes, what happens of course, subsequently is that we go through quite significant transmutations, particularly in the era in which with the rise of British capitalism, there's a hard turn to empiricism. And I can't track that adequately right, right now, uh, except to say that I hope I do it, you know, bits of justice in passing. I'll simply say that the replacement of ancient philosophy by liberal political economy in the English case is at some levels a theoretical regression, even though it elucidates and illuminates uh, power relations in quite new ways. Uh, the question which I hope I got adequately about structural relations of reproduction and their relationship to to money. You know, this is huge. And, and, and I'm just going to really refer to one set of insights here in thinking about modern capitalism, because one of the things that social reproduction theory in particular is compelling us to do is to think through the and the other circuit to capital, what Michael Leibowitz has called the circuit of wage labor. In other words, capital reproduces itself in and through wage labor, but wage labor has to reproduce itself through a complex array of monetized and non-monetized social processes. And one of the things that we're grappling with, with the circuit of wage labor, how do people who are dispossessed and reliant on wage labor reproduce themselves is that it is not simply through the exchange for money wages. That's decisively important, but there are a whole series of non monetized labor processes which are essential to social reproduction. And of course, Tithy's work has been foundational for the thinking of so many of us, myself included in this regard. Finally, Colin Moores uh, puts on the table the enormous question of slavery, money, and capitalism. And I will simply say to you that this is something I've been continuing to work on. Uh, I'm in fact right now writing a, a, a piece for a forthcoming volume called In the Tracks of CLR James, where among other things, I actually argue that James's claim about the proto-proletarian character of bonded labor in Saint-Domingue on the sugar plantations is a fundamentally important and powerful but undeveloped insight, and we need to move in its tracks. There's absolutely no question in my mind, A, that capitalism in the new world is impossible without the histories of bonded labor. Slave labor is essential and instrumental. And number two, that these are, again, to mention an article by the 1970s, this one, Jairus Banaji's modes of production in, in a materialist conception of history. If it is surplus value positing labor, if it is commodity producing labor through which surplus value is accumulated, it is operating in the circuits of capital, not outside the circuits of capital. Okay, Maya, would you like to add anything? No? Okay, let's go back to the questions then. Uh, and let's take a question from Veronica. Can the first modular form of money be restated, redefined. Is there any major distinction between ancient money that we should make with the modern modes? Mm -hmm. uh, a second question. The stock market is another distinct level of abstracting labor, or is it just a different, more immaterial degree of paper money? <laughs> 
why is the economy so dependent on the stock market? David, do you want to take those two and then we'll see if there are any other contributions? Yes, thank you. The distinction I really want to drive at from the first form uh, that Veronica asks about through the other three forms is that we could argue that we see an increasing abstraction in the modular forms of money. Put differently, coinage has a tangibility as a product of labor. Now, of course, coins become eventually largely symbolic, as Marx talks about. There's decreasingly a relationship between the nominal value of a coin and the amount of precious metal in it. But fundamentally in the ancient world, we really are much closer to a system of pure commodity money. That is to say that money is exchanging with other commodities much more directly in terms of inherent value. And so coins can be melted down and recommodified in other forms and so on. So this is a much less abstracted form of money than paper money. That means that it can function as, as a direct commodity in a way that paper money can't. Paper money can't be melted down into something else. You can't sell off the paper as if it's really got any commodity value in and of itself. And so the relationship between monies and commodities becomes increasingly mediated and abstracted. And as that relationship becomes increasingly abstracted, it gives this enormously growing autonomy to the financial sphere, which is both a huge accelerator for capitalism and an also a potentially huge destabilizer. And that's one of the things I was trying to emphasize maybe too hastily at the end. So the second modular form still has a legal tie to precious metal. The Bank of England, say, has to keep precious metal equal to 20% of the amount of bills it has in circulation. Now, of course, the paper superstructure isn't really adequately supported by the metallic substructure, if you will. But nevertheless, it's there and it constrains the system in a variety of ways. Once we move, and this will help with the question of the stock market, once we move to a foundational form of money which is purely futural. In other words, it has no more ties to past labor. Ancient, the ancient form being fully grounded in past labor. The second modular form from the Bank of England being precariously linked to past labor. And the modern form since 1971-73, utterly emancipated from a connection to past labor. It is now simply a claim on future wealth. And so that strange inscription that I showed you on a British pound, it means that we move in late capitalism through a world of digital and paper forms whose connection to living labor seems almost non-existent. And as both Tithy and Maya were suggesting, that's where the defetishizing criticism comes in to indicate that as much as they are formally emancipated from a relationship to labor, they are still grounded, but the grounding comes when a crisis reveals, this is the transition to stocks, that you bought a stock at X amount, but the market, which is in a tailspin, now informs you that you're never going to get all the future labor that you thought that stock was a claim on. So stocks are a claim on future profits which come out of labor. Government debt is a claim on future labor that comes out of taxes. But this futural structure, no grounding, no rooting in past labor, as I say, both gives the financial sector this enormous capacity to inflate, but it also produces these enormous fault lines of instability. And it's why I suggested at the end of the talk that in our period, 
every crisis of capitalism will involve financial and monetary crises. It's inherent in this structure. But keep in mind that stocks are simply one other paper claim to future wealth, to the proceeds of future labor. And as a result, they're subject both to enormous speculation, but also susceptible to huge crashes. Okay, uh, Tiffy Meyer, have you anything you wish to add to that? Okay, I'm going to take one more question, then I'm going to ask for concluding comments, and we'll wrap up within, say, 15 minutes. Uh, do you have any thoughts, comments on the proposals to redesign money, as put forward, for example, by Alf Hornberg? Uh, how could such a monetary reform be accomplished according to you? So a sort of future-looking question, David, and then we'll just give all three of you an opportunity for two minutes each. Right. We are going to see a boatload of proposals to redesign money, to reform it in various ways. Modern monetary theory thinks that it has come up with, you know, a, a, a theorization of fiat money that is entirely sort of uh, appropriate to the new world in which we live. I can't do my critique of modern monetary theory right now. But what I will say to you is this. Money is inherently rent by rivalry because of the point I made earlier, indebted to Colin Barker, many states. And one of the things which is happening in this current inflection of global crises is that there are attempts to work out alternatives to the US dollar. It's going to be a very complicated process, but the European Central Bank has now made its bonds much more significant players in global financial markets in this crisis than ever before. And the Chinese state is moving its currency into a more dominant position than ever before. Will they displace the US dollar in short order? No. Will new crises perhaps unleash greater instabilities and rivalries between these three dominant currency blocks, the Chinese yuan, the US dollar, and the euro? Quite possibly. It will also quite conceivably induce alliances between two blocks against another and so on. But there is no way in a capitalist society in which the alienated, abstracted character of money can be removed. It is a product of alienated and abstracted social relations of production and domination. And as a result, what we want to do is to track its modalities, but not imagine short of a socialist transformation that any amount of monetary engineering is going to change the system. It will not. Okay, thank you, David. Are there any comments by the Tiffy or Maya? Or any concluding comments you wish to make, David? Everyone should buy David's book, engage with it. And uh, just, just to make a very tiny point that David brought up about conditions of life and life making, you know, one of the things that was so important for us to witness during this pandemic was actually mutual aid um, and direct uh, sort of reciprocity between humans and our communities, right? So these kind of unmediated direct uh, modes of human relationship um, are muffled and, and um, and silenced in the general operation of the economy. So when the economy stalled and actually the state could not perform uh, certain functions that these mutual aid networks emerged. And I think in the days 
uh, ahead, we are going to see this sort of um, relationship between states trying to pull back and reinforce the power of blood and money. And we are going to see resistance to it on the streets, both as direct responses to, to that, but also more directly in setting up of or trying to set up alternative networks of exchange, gifting, and, and mutual um, loving relationship beyond the powers of the market, which necessarily cannot sustain itself, as David pointed out, that within this system, we cannot have alternative um, little islands of socialist mutual um, aid, but they show us the, you know, sort of to go back to the point of imminence, that these are the modes that we can see that probably will take full fruition if we can strip off the alienated power of money and hence blood over our lives. Okay, have we any last comments? in the panel um yeah i just i guess want to want to say thank you again and, and yes definitely by the book and i just think you know this discussion really brings up um the power of of marxist analysis to really you know disaggregate the forms of domination that our bodies and and you know our communities are under and so that you know there's a i don't think we discussed that much so much today but the the element of, of struggle and the potentiality of struggle and and this you know the um, amazing mapping across all these historical periods uh just you know even though the, the topic is always um so tough but uh it actually gives you that sense that there is always transformation there's always possibilities and the point that uh david was saying about the the bits of, of the body and other in societies that are hidden or that are that, that lose their function, but are still the remnants of those different functions are always there. And that's something I think very beautiful to, to end up for me anyway. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of announcements before everybody leaves to enjoy their lockdown. First of all, uh, buy the book. It's published, I'm sure someone will, remem will remind me shortly who it's published by, maybe Haymarket Books. You should definitely look at their website. There is a sale on during uh, the next 10 days of HM Online. And Haymarket have very kindly facilitated uh, this presentation for us. Uh, HM Online is an 11-day festival of panels by which we seek to keep a connection with the left uh, in lieu of our normal London conference. Panels include Panels on COVID-19, Engels at 200, the US election of 2020, uh, gender, transgender and queer Marxisms and social reproduction, notes from below and workers' struggles, notes from below, sorry, and workers' struggles, historicizing law and capitalism. And once again, you'll be able to meet Maya. Uh, Heart, art, performance and cultural resistance, Marxism, identity and intersectional frameworks, class and race in the US, critical interrogations of Marxist theory, 21st century politics and Turkish politics. And of course, as always, we'll be hosting the Isaac and Tamara Deutsche Prize Memorial Lecture, which is Brett Christopher's The New Enclosure, The Appropriation of Public Land in Neoliberal Britain. You can see the times and register for all those sessions on our website, historicalmaterialism.org. Uh, registration always closes 60 minutes before the session in order that the invitations get out in good time. Uh, we also have on Saturday the 7th at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, GMT, uh, a Meet the Editors. Uh, the code for that is going out on Twitter and will be on our website. And that's a unique opportunity to talk to editors like Maya, who I forgot to mention is actually chair at the moment of the HM editorial board, and talk about submitting and how the journal uh, does its editorial work. Finally, thanks to all three of the speakers and thanks for you for watching. Uh, I know you have an awful lot of other commitments that you have, uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and that's the first session finished. Thank you. Thanks to Paul. Thank you all.